Okay, so it's Friday, March 26th, 2021. I think I need some oil in the chair here. I'll change the oil in my chair. All right, uh, so uh, first things first, I noticed that, uh, yes, good afternoon, yeah. Um, uh, one thing that I noticed uh, that there was, for some reason, we were missing some slides from the first presentations. So I have upgraded the uh, um, lecture post-it notes, uh, which is the 7A, all right? So uh, you might want to throw that one out if you downloaded it for yourself, uh, the previous one. I have just uploaded this this morning. And this is going to be the additional slides that we really do need for that. So first, we're going to uh, complete that first presentation. So this was, um, that was the category cabling, which is this one right here. Okay. Now, um, one thing that is, uh, that, that says, uh, okay, let me just, uh, Get this thing on the full screen of my thing here. So category cabling. So one thing here is like, can you spot any cabling faults here? If you can see this thing clearly, anybody can see what the problem is with this cable arrangement or with this situation. Let's pretend these are, um, let's say cut six A cables. Looks tight. That's one thing. Zip ties. There we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, zip ties is the problem in this type of installation. What should we use for this? We should use Velcro. And when we use Velcro, it should be, I say sticky side in, uh, it should be the soft side in. Uh, so uh, that's the thing. Now, uh, also, I, I took that picture in one of the bigger facilities uh, around our city, and uh, uh, I just made sure that uh, you can't tell which cables these are. Uh, if I told you that they were cut 6A cables, <clears throat> you could probably believe it. And if somebody told me that, I would also believe that. But really, these are coaxial cables. Yeah, there's a bunch of coaxial cables. Still, I wouldn't uh, do the zip ties with even coaxial cables, because remember, that might change. What could it change? It could affect the characteristic impedance. Uh, however, uh, in some cases, it affects it more. In some cases, it affects it less. But Velcro is the answer all the way. I know we have done some... Um, patch panels, the, the little small patch panels that we have uh, done during our lab. And we used zip ties in that one, but I was very careful telling you how, if you're going to use the zip tie in this situation. Uh, remember, I was telling you uh, that uh, you should just zip it or bind it very lightly, just so it just keeps things in place. You should never have a zip tie around the cables in a way that is so tight that it actually changes the structure that pinches into that uh, cable because then you are actually changing the specifications of the cable and it is not for the better. All right, so, uh, <clears throat> so that was the problem with that one. Uh, here's the Velcro. We already uh, covered that one last, uh, last time here. And... This picture, if you see, you're going to see that uh, uh, very clearly when you download this um, presentation. Somebody took a picture, instructional picture, and they used the rough side in and the soft side out. So I just wanted to point this out. This is wrong. The soft side of the tape is on the outside of the bind. So this is wrong. The soft side should be in. Not that it's going to make that much of a difference. So, okay, so we have done that uh, last presentation. We talked about the crosstalk. Um, yeah, the pleasant people. I hope you guys have watched this uh, video here. It's just, uh, you know, it's, it's informative kind of a video here. 
unshielded twisted pair we have covered and we have covered the shielded twisted pair and remember just a, as a reminder what is the purpose of the twist okay the purpose of the twist is to eliminate crosstalk and how is it done it is so the induction doesn't have that much that much of a chance to occur between the pairs so uh, you can see clearly on this picture here yeah, that these this green pair and there's a train <laughs> and there is this uh, brown pair and the orange and the blue they are two <laughs> yeah i got it you're a big boy okay big horn <laughs> okay um all right so this uh the twist of the green pair and the twist of the uh, brown pair, for example, they are at different rates. So what happens when we have the pairs that are twisted at different rates, the magnetic field or the electromagnetic field that is building around the pairs, it builds with slightly different structure. So when you twist the pairs at different rates, the electromagnetic field doesn't have as much power to, um, uh, to enter the other pair. Okay. So that's um, that's the, uh, the reason. The purpose of the twist is to eliminate crosstalk. And remember, um, when we talked about the crosstalk in digital transmission, the crosstalk is going to completely fail the transmission. The transmission is going to we can, when you happen when when you get a crosstalk in, in a digital transmission. Uh, you get those extra ones and zeros, those extra pulses that the receiver is basically not able to translate one good pulse from another that is not supposed to be there. And it just says, sorry, I can't read, so I'm just going to shut down. When it comes to analog transmission, then uh, we are going to be annoyed with some other picture interfering with the original picture or maybe the audio is going to be uh, you're going to hear another conversation or something like that or you're going to hear a buzz or things like that so in analog it's it's an annoying uh, thing in digital it just shuts the transmission completely down okay so uh shield a twisted pair we have covered that now uh, there is that um uh slide that was missing from that one from the original uh well, I mean, last week's copper clad aluminum cladding is basically um, um, a coating or hugging or embracing um, so here's the uh, the magnification of conductors so uh, if you have a cable that says cca and of course that is going to be less expensive to buy because it's an aluminum the, the cable is using aluminum conductors and uh, the aluminum conductors are covered with copper or cladded with copper so that's what uh, that's what cca means whenever you read the specifications and that's the, that's basically what the cross section looks like when you see cca um if you really want to have really really good reliable transmission i would try to stay away from cca even though it is less expensive all right so you want a bc which says for bare copper so all the conductor is all the way through made out of copper and this uh is this uh, that has to do with those uh th this table here remember uh cat five which is obsolete pretty much now cuts uh well you can still use it for some control signals like uh if you run out of well you can use to, uh, you can connect the old conventional telephone sets with uh cat five you won't be able to connect voip telephone uh, sets with cat five you need minimum cat 5e this is just a review from last time but over here <coughs> excuse me uh when you see this um uh said cat 5e uh here's the bandwidth and the bandwidth uh is different um uh, from the uh transfer speed transfer speed is transmitting the pulses and you can transmit more pulses plus you're going you to use certain types of modulations when it comes to transmitting the digital information and it's different from transmitting an analog uh, uh signals 
And remember, with the uh, also as a as a review, uh, time division multiplexing is going to be used in this digital um, transmission for the most part. And uh, usually, in, when it comes to bandwidth, uh, it comes to play when we have frequency division multiplexing, which means that we have one transmission line, and on that transmission line, we have different channels that are assigned to the fre different frequency um, slots. Okay, uh, so uh, it's just like uh, just like the air. There's an antenna, radio antenna transmitting, and air is being the medium for transmission instead of cable. So uh, uh, antenna is transmitting different frequencies, and on in your car on the radio, you can tune to whatever frequency you want. So that would be the frequency division multiplexing. And that's when analog transmission comes in, and you can see that the bandwidth for that is different than the transfer speed, because it's, things are happening in, in a different way. And you can see that, the by the way, uh, the internet that goes into your modem from outside, you have a modem in your house, so from outside, you're going to have uh, cable coming in to your house so that internet signal is in an analog form okay? so that's where bandwidth plays the role the modem takes that and it transfer transfers that into a digital signal so that's where the ethernet goes on the other side of the modem so modem uh you know in, in one way it's it's it modulates the signal and it shoots it outside or it receives the modulated signal and demodulates it and uh, basically puts it on the in the Ethernet format. So it modulates and demodulates, modulates, demodulates, modem. That's how the modem got its name. All right. Uh, so um, uh, you could see the CCA and BC. So here's CCA and BC bare copper. So copper cladded aluminum or bare copper, you could just see that uh, the, just the pure copper or bare copper uh, is actually going to give you a more bandwidth. It's going to be a better transfer uh, medium for transferring the analog signals. Okay? All right, so that's uh, that's as far as the picture. Now, this was this was this slide wasn't in there. Now we're going to just take a look, quick look at the T five sixty eight wiring detail, and uh, we all have done it by now uh, in our labs. Uh, uh, this was the RG45 modular plug, and this is how we count the pins. Right? Uh, when we hold the, uh, the little latching clip that is supposed to latch into the structure when we insert the plug, it's on the other side. We don't see it. It's, it's pointing away from us, and this is how we count the pins. It has nothing to do with counting pairs. This is how we count the pins. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pins in a modular plug. Now, uh, when we when it comes to counting pairs, um, see here's the pin. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this corresponds to the pins of that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight right here. Okay, so that's the first column, which is pin. And this other one is shows the pair and there's a pair for t568a and t568b and remember when we did cat 5e uh, the difference between a and b is that we switch the orange and the green pairs and that's how we go from a configuration to b configuration and as we remember if you have a to a uh, on both uh, on each side, if you have a piece of cable and you have if you have terminated the jack in A configuration, and on the other side in A, you have a straight link. If you terminate one end in B and the other one also in B, you also have a straight link. Now, when things are, ha are happening different, when you have one in A and one in B, then you have something that's called a crossover cable, and, <clears throat> and there are two different types of crossover cables. Uh, that uh, I'm, we're going to uh, take a look at the next uh, next couple of slides, but just um, uh, just how you can see this picture here. So here is pair one. Remember, pair one is always in the middle. That's the two middle prongs, which would be pin four and five. Okay? 
so um, uh, always blue goes. So in this case, um, uh, between that's a cat five e configuration. Okay, so always the blues are going to be not interchanged. So they're both of, they're same for both configuration, and you can tell that also the browns are not changed. What happens is the greens and the oranges are going to be switched uh, from A to B, all right? And uh, what happens is that one is, uh, when it comes to green and orange, one pair is transmitting, the other pair is receiving. Now, one pair transmits, one pair receives, which is which? How can you tell? Well, it depends on from which side you're looking at. Uh, into the cable, right? So uh, if you're looking from the side, you're going to receive the signal on orange pair. Um, and if you turn around, if you go in the other way, uh, the other piece of equipment, it's just going to be the other way that the receive is going to be different than the transmit, obviously, okay? Uh, so in order for the transmission to take place properly, you would have to have the transmitting pair of one end connected to the receiving pair uh, a terminal on the other end so the transmission can take place. And on the other side, there'll be a transmitting pair on that connected to the receiving pair on the other end. Um, simple, okay? Sip a coffee. All right. So um, uh, this, you can see the differences between A and B configurations. And um, also um, you could see transmission and the receiving pairs, depending on where you are, okay? And also on here, it's showing you which is tip and which is ring. And this tip and ring is different from the telephony, because remember the tip is still more positive um, in the telephony. The tip side is more positive than the ring. So the tip is always more positive than the ring, okay? except in telephony, the tip, is at the ground level. So the ring is more negative than the tip, but it, so it, with a reference to ground, it's going to be a negative thing. So uh, that's, how, that's how that thing is solved. But in this data transmission, the tip and ring, uh, again, tip is more positive than the ring, uh, but, uh, but the ring is actually, for the most part, is going to be uh, rather, equal with the grounding level, okay? Because uh, with this one, we are not transmitting things over the air. And remember the reason for the uh, polarity in telephony, the reasoning for that was that when the telegraph lines were being pulled along the railways in the old days, we're talking about uh, you know early 1900s, uh, then uh, <clears throat> uh, when the ring, which is more positive, more negative than the tip, and the tip is more positive, if it was just a sort of quote unquote proper polarity as they thought it would be at first, then the cables would be corroding a lot. So uh, they, they solved the corrosion problem by switching the polarity. So the tip would be at the, um, uh, the tip would be at the ground level and the ring would be just more negative than the ground. Okay. Uh, so that's how you read this uh, kind of a picture. Now, um, when we look at CAT 5E here, some of the less expensive cables that you're going to buy, um, you're going to notice that uh, they do not contain all the pairs. Okay. Uh, some, you can actually buy patch cables that are really, really cheap, and they, they will be called CAT 5E patch cables. And a patch cable is, uh, um, is a... Um, short piece of cable and they come in different lengths. You can also make them on your own. Uh, we just did that in a, one of our labs, but you can buy them in, uh, uh, in half a foot length, one foot length, six feet or 10 feet or whatever the, whoever the, uh, the, the distributor sells, uh, whatever the lengths they are, but these are the most common lengths. And depending on what you're doing, if you have a patch panel uh, and underneath that you have a switch and you're just going to connect one to one, then obviously you won't want to get a bunch of short ones because you don't want to have a mess around your rack, okay? So, uh, uh, and some of the less expensive cable, uh, patch cables, you're going to get in just orange and green configuration. Okay? 
uh, and you're going to be missing the blue and you're going to be missing the brown. And uh, when you look at the jack, you're going to see actually that you're going to be missing some prongs in there. Right? So, but sometimes you're going to get CAD 5E patch cables that are having all the, all the conductors. Uh, and sometimes, so it's a very common thing. So when you see something like that, pay attention. When you see a patch cord, just take a look. I bet one of these days you're going to find one that's actually green and orange and that's it. So that's CAT 5E. So what do we have here? Uh, we have um, uh, NIC, which would be network interface card. And this would be the jack at your either PC that, uh, well, um, about 20 or 30 years ago, uh, everything would be card based. So you would get a big box uh, with your PC and whatever you want to get in there, however you want to arm, if you will, this whole box. Uh, if you needed a, the system to be on the network, you would have to buy a network card and you would just open the box, put that card in, close the box and you have to configure this whole thing. Now it's plug and play. And a lot of the computers right now, most of the computers will have that network interface card as integral part of the motherboard. Uh, <clears throat> now in the laptops as well, you're going to have that as part of the motherboard. However, you can also get some other uh, cards that, uh, that you can also add depending on the, on the laptop. And now quite often in the new laptops, you, you won't even have that. You will just have a USB port and you know, in, in, into the USB port, you're just going to have to have some kind of separate device that you plug into USB port. And over here, you have the ethernet port. Uh, so <clears throat> things are changing all the time. But this, for the, just, to, just to simplify things, this is going to be called NIC as network interface card. So that means the port, the ethernet port uh, that is on the computer or laptop or computer. I just call it computer, okay? Or a terminal. Um, now, uh, MDI, this would be a medium dependent interface. That's a mouthful and it sounds very, very sophisticated, uh, sophisticating. Uh, now, <clears throat> what's a medium? A medium is a, a, a material through which the signal travels. Now, uh, the, the, uh, for the most part that we have here in the category cabling, our medium is copper, all right? When we go to the uh, optical fiber, the medium through which the signal travels would be uh, optical fiber, fiber optics, you know, glass or right now plastic as well. And interface stands for interface. It's a device, okay? An interface, uh, remember uh, the meaning of interface is uh, is a is a is a spot that uh, something changes into something else. Okay? So when you have, for example, optic when it, when the light travels and it hits the water or glass, and then it starts traveling through the other medium. So for, let's say this is glass, this is air. Uh, then uh, that line here would be called interface. In electronics, interface would be a piece of device. It could be a specific device that uh, changes something into something else. So interface is a very um, universal type of a word. Okay? And on the other side, we have a hub, or we could have a switch, or we could have any other kind of a device, a router, modem. And usually things are configured in such way that when you have a PC, let's just call it a PC here, and then you have a device such as switch or a modem or a router or a hub. Then you would connect that in with the straight links and those ports would be configured in a way that you would be automatically connecting a transmission line to a receiving transmission terminal into receiving terminal. This is how physically the pinout of those ports are configured. Uh, now, when you have to connect things different, like for example, if you need to connect two PCs together, so here is NIC and here is NIC, network interface card and network interface card. Obviously, if you connected two of these in that way, 
you would not have a proper connection because you will be connecting a transmitting terminal into a transmitting terminal on the other side and receiving terminal into the receiving terminal on the other side. They would just not be able to talk. So when you connect two devices that are alike, like, like for example, uh, two PCs, network interface cards, then you have to just switch things around. So, uh, so you will connect the transmitting line terminal from one thing to the other uh, uh, receiving terminal, and from the other one will be transmitting terminal to the uh, next one uh, will be the receive. So you just have to switch things around, and that's how that's that's the reason why we would use crossover cables. Okay? That is crossover cable now. Um, when you, um, when, uh, I encourage you to just Google crossover cable and hit images okay? or crossover patch cable. Don't do it now, just one after we, uh, we're done with the, our lesson here. Um, when you research that on Google, you are going to see two different images and you're going to go, oh, what is going on? Because you're going to see some of the crossover schemes, wiring schemes, uh, that uh, have orange and greens uh, switched over, and that's it. And the blues and the browns are going to be not interchanged. And in some images, you're going to see orange and greens switched around, and you're also going to see the blues and the browns switched around. So what's going on? Why are both, you know, is somebody, did somebody make a mistake? Or, you know, uh, what's going on here? Uh, the reason is that... Um, um, when, when we're using CAT5E, up to CAT5E, um, we are only using orange and green pairs, okay? So that uh, knowledge can help you with, uh, with troubleshooting some things. Like for example, I, um, uh, years ago, I, I had a security camera installation and uh, the client wanted me to reuse the, wire, the existing wiring wherever the existing cameras were and there's some add more wiring. They just want to save money and they knew what comes with it because you, know, you can't guarantee the, the, uh, um, the existing cabling was intact, uh, but that's what the client wanted, right? So um, uh, I was able to test uh, all the cables and one of the transmission uh, failed. Uh, so I look, just looked what failed and uh, I looked, there was some broken conductor and the conductor was blue. So I knew that the camera is using uh, CAT5E, so the blue is not even being used. So yes, it failed the test, the link failed the test, but it's still going to work because in that CAT5E transmission, only oranges and greens are being used. So that knowledge can help you when you're troubleshooting uh, down the road when you find yourself jobs, okay? Uh, so, um, so here it is in our um, uh, meter. Uh, this is how a crossover would manifest itself. So if you take that picture and just flip it around uh, 90 degrees, that's what we're going to see in our test results. So there's a little X here that says it failed, okay? But it's also showing A and B here, all right? Uh, and uh, it failed a straight link test. Uh, but it is showing us how things are connected. It's showing us the wire map. And if you look at this picture, and if you compare that to the other picture here, which is a crossover cable, basically it is a crossover connection. That's how you can tell. And this one says that performed uh, some light duty frequency response tests with the 100 base T, okay, which is that uh, it should, uh, this cable is uh, capable of transmitting 100 megabits per second. Okay, and remember when it comes to transmitting speed, we're talking bits, megabits, gigabits. And when it comes to describing a storage on a hard drive, we're using bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes. We are not going to say that the cable is capable of transmitting five kilobytes per second. Although technically you would be able to calculate to the bits, but it just so happens that we're des we describe the speed in bits per second, and we describe the storage in bytes per second. Okay. Uh, all right, so here is the other cross connect cable, different from the other one, because you can see 
everything is interchanged. The oranges and the greens are interchanged and the blues and the browns are also switched. That comes from, that comes, uh, that configuration is cat six and up, okay? Because cat 5e only uses one transmission and receiving channel, which would be have which would have transmitting and receiving, and that's it. And cat six and up, they're using two pairs to transmit, and they're using two pairs to receive. Okay? So all the pairs are being utilized with cat six and up. So that's why when you're going to deal with um, various types of equipment, and usually you're going to connect those crossover cables or patch cords, which comes CAT 5E or 6, uh, when we're going to connect, uh, let's say, switches, you're going to cascade the switches. Remember, we're talking the ring topology, connecting different switches to make it, uh, to, to, to increase the capacity of the system, because the one switch could just have 24 channels, but maybe this building that we have, or this floor requires more than 24 channels. So you would have another 24 channels switch, but they have to be connected together. So they act as one switch, and then they're connected further down the road to whatever else they need to be connected. So uh, most of the time you're going to be required connecting them with CAT6, cables and some of the switches uh, are require require uh, uh, crossover cables some of the switches are going to be specified for straight uh, links uh, to connect those uh, those switches and some of them are going to have an automatic sensing that no matter what you connect crossover or uh, or straight you're going to that equipment is going to just do some kind of little bit of a testing by itself and it's going to determine okay this thing is crossover so i'm going to switch it to a crossover transmission so some of them are specified one way some of them are specified the other way and some of them are just automatic no matter how what you plug in they're going to work although cat6 requires cat6 patch cables and cat5e so you cannot uh, use cat5e cross over cable uh, when you need to have CAT6 simply because those two pairs are not going, there's only two pairs are going to be used, not all four. So you are not going to have the full CAT6 capability of a transmission. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, so you need the CAT6 cable. So that's why you're going to see, sometimes you're going to see something like this, this kind of a picture. And sometimes you're going to have, see something like this when you Google or research crossover cable. And the reason is that one is specified for CAT 5E up to CAT 5E, and the other one is specified for CAT 6 and up. So here's the mystery solved. All right. That is the, um, the end of that. Um, these are the uh, additional slides that we're missing. And that is already, this uh, presentation is already uploaded onto, uh, onto our server. So you can just go and, uh, and replace the previous one with this one, it's uh, 7A, okay? So now uh, let me just queue up the other, uh, the other presentation here. Let me turn this one off. And we were talking about the security fire and surveillance. Here it is. And we stopped. Last time we talked, we stopped at uh, after we have done the security. Now, the one thing uh, I'm going to mention, because uh, we all already described how the glass break sensor works. Uh, remember when we talked about the glass break sensing? It used to be uh, years ago, and still you can see in some of the really old abandoned buildings or old buildings that are going to have windows. You're going to have some kind of a silver tape around those uh, windows, or sometimes it's going to be in a zigzag form. This is how the glass break sensing was done. Uh, you break the glass, uh, and that little tape is broken, so the loop is broken, so there's an alarm. Uh, the alarm is being triggered uh, when it's armed. Um, now the glass break sensors are not using utilizing tapes. They're utilizing um, sound uh, and pressure 
sensing devices. Um, so the what you see here on the screen is a motion sensor, but uh, I'm talking about the glass break detector. Um, as we remember from the last presentation, just a review, glass break sensor will sense that really high pitch screeching noise of the glass being begin the glass beginning to break. So that frequency is going to be there. And then uh, um, it's going to be associated with low frequency rumble. And then it's going to be followed by sudden pressure change. All these three conditions uh, present, the glass break sensor is going to trigger an alarm. We don't want to the glass break sensor to trigger if those three conditions are not present because that would cause a false alarm. And uh, as much as we want the alarm to trigger when it's supposed to, we also don't want this thing to trigger when it's not supposed to, because the response teams, uh, usually police, in, it goes by the city, and different cities have different bylaws when it comes to police responding to the alarm systems. And uh, whoever is doing in the alarm business, they will be familiar with, uh, with the bylaws that, uh, that are with the, by city. Or if you become a dealer of a monitoring company, which you can become, um, uh, you, can, you, you can become a dealer of a monitoring company. How does that work? Um, this is how you make residual income. Uh, you inst if you are in, in, into alarm system installations, um, you install the system. The client wants to usually businesses, they want to be, uh, they, they want to have a monitoring uh, done, which means that if the alarm triggers, it doesn't just make noise, it actually sends a signal to something that's called a monitoring station. The alarms are not connected straight to police. They're called, they're connected to something that's called a monitoring station. And the purpose of the monitoring station is to provide 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 a day, uh, year, days a year, uh, active monitoring service. So if the alarm triggers, the signal is being sent to them, they receive that and uh, the live personnel reacts accordingly to what the condition is. So uh, you, might, you might actually, uh, whenever, you, uh, when, whenever you set up the monitoring of whatever the facility is, you might request that if the door front door opens, uh, do this. If the back window breaks, do that. So usually, when the you know when when the front door opens, uh, there's an alarm. Uh, the monitoring company would just pick up the phone and they would call the facility just to make sure that there would be a set of passwords and replies kind of set up. So just to make sure that you are legit. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Everything is good. Or if somebody is not able to provide uh, to say whatever they expected them to say, uh, usually it's a verbal password or maybe some other additional security features, then uh, they're going to say, oh, uh, send the police then, right? And then, um, uh, so that depends on, but how it works, um, you set up an account for the client, you get certain amount of money from the client, and part of that goes to the monitoring station. You pay for the service per client and the rest you keep. Well, this thing starts making sense after you have maybe 200 clients, then uh, you're making some uh, significant amount of money and then uh, you can just build it up uh, from there. If you had one window cracked open and a different one was broken, would the alarm go off? Uh, that's a very good question, okay? Because uh, then you might not have the um, sudden pressure change, right? Uh, so that's why I always recommend, uh, and I really, really, it worked. Uh, you always, you, you just do the, the uh, sort of like a double security thing. Uh, I always, whenever I installed the um, glass break detectors in a room, I always back them up with the motion sensors. So usually uh, just to kind of a double whammy, kind of a double protection, uh, you are going to have a broken uh, window and then somebody walks in and he's going to have a motion sensor triggered. So usually both of them will work, but then 
one backs the other. If one doesn't work, the other works. Uh, so always, these are electronic devices. They are not smart like people are. So uh, you don't rely on them kind of trying to make a decision. It's a piece of electronic equipment that is set up to work a certain way. So yeah, that's a very interesting question. If you're in the security business, I would recommend if you want to have a proper, um, proper, properly set up alarm system, you're going to have the double features like that. So if you have glass break, back it up with motion sensor, uh, and you can put them on different zones. You can put them in the same zone, uh, wire them in series. But then the monitoring station will have no way to tell which kicked in. Was it the motion sensor or was it the, uh, the glass break? Just say that the zone got triggered. Um, but if you have them on two separate zones, they will be able to tell. First, the glass break went and then the motion sensor went. So that kind of gives them uh, more possibilities to make a conscious decision of what is happening quicker. All right. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, when I was in the alarm business, whenever I installed alarm for the, uh, for the um, commercial use or residential, uh, I would always set up this uh, system in a way that after I am done with it, I hand over the passwords and let the client know how to change their own passwords. After I'm gone, I could not even break myself into a system that I have installed. Now, then you know that the system is installed properly. Okay. Um, so here, now, how does the motion sensor work? There are different types of sensing. Usually it is uh, detecting motion of an infrared energy. We all humans, we, we transmit certain amount of inter infrared energy that sensor sees that and when the sensor sees that this thing is being moved the energy that you have around you the infrared energy um, then it triggers okay so that's why you also have motion sensors that are pet immune um, i i would install them a lot just because they're better than the not pet immune and what's a pet immune uh, motion sensor or motion detector it would be a detector that would be able to bypass um by pound so it says specified to bypass a dog up to 40 pounds or up to 80 pounds things like that okay um, now from my experience is that uh yeah okay if you have dogs or cats running around the house uh, when you alarm, when you arm the system um then um mm, there's always a possibility of that thing triggering, even if it's a pet immune uh, motion sensor. What if you walked around uh, by, okay, what if you walked by in some tin foil, would it be, <laughs> would it set off? Yes, it would set off. Uh, um, Actually, when I was uh, when I was in business, uh, we would attend you know the, all the companies that would they would we would once in a while we would be invited to uh, seminars that were organized by companies who sell the products. Okay, and and uh, we would have some fun trying to bypass uh, the motion sensors that they produced. Um, based on our knowledge, and trust me, uh, they are <laughs> those are pretty good. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. Uh, some of them, uh, some of the uh, motion sensors utilize infrared technology, uh, single beam, double beam. Uh, sometimes they uh, utilize uh, infrared, uh, not so infrared, the microwave technology as well. So instead of having an infrared sensing. Uh, um, features they would use uh, microwave um, microwave technology to detect motion so then you never know where those things are how they work how many of them they are so that's you know when you install a system try to install it in a way that you couldn't break into the room by or the facility by yourself and trust me when you do that kind of stuff you are going to have situations that people try to break in because the more clients you get, statistically, you are going to encounter situations that somebody 
calls you in the middle of the night or something, say, hey, thank, you know, there's many phone calls I got in the middle of the night. Say, hey, you know what? Guess what? Somebody tried to break in. It worked. Thank you. You know, I did. I'm not, I'm not joking. I, 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 I did receive those phone calls once in a while when I was in the business. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So this is about the alarm systems. Uh, now we're going to switch over to uh, fire alarm systems. Let me just... Uh, So here's a typical um, diagram of a fire alarm system. Now, in some ways, fire alarms are um, simpler than the security alarms because they just don't have so many devices. But in some other ways, they are a little bit more complicated or more strict as far as installations. Now, when a security alarm, uh, just a burglary alarm, um, there are different... Uh, there are different specs you have to follow, different restrictions, because uh, uh, you're going to have to install things a little bit different if it's just for your home, private use, or somebody's home, or just a regular business, or if you're going to uh, be required to install a security alarm or burglary alarm uh, to facilities like uh, banks and, and whatnot. So there's a little bit different uh, ball game when, uh, when it comes to differentiating between those situations, okay? Now, when it comes to fire alarm, uh, as far as the devices, um, that's slightly more simple, however, uh, well, before we get to the however, let's just analyze this little picture here, shall we? Here's the main panel, and usually the fire alarms would be painted red, okay? Now, what do we have here? We have the sensing um, uh, part of it, which would be the sensors connected. We do have the annunciating part, which makes noise, and... Um, that should always be accompanied by a PA system. Uh, now, sometimes the PA system, like in our college, the fire alarm um, annunciators or the ringers uh, or the noisemakers, they also act as speakers for the PA system. So the PA system or public address is the integral part it's kind of integrated with the alarm system and that's okay because you need to be you know to make an announcement hello everybody this is a drill uh can you do this and do that uh, whatever follow the drill um, um personnel and uh, just do what you're supposed to do or sometimes you're gonna say no this is not a drill this is a real fire everybody leave the building now all right things like that so the pa system should be part of it uh, you should be you know, every commercial system should have some sort of p public address system <clears throat> now so um then you have the strobes so there are certain specifications on what is the noise level that is required uh, for the fire alarm? And then as far as the strobe lights, um, uh, they should be flashing, letting you know that there's a fire alarm going on. So sensing part of the fire alarm, and you're going to have the annunciating part, and then you're going to have the communication part, and you're going to have the control part of this. So we don't have any control part here yet. So the sensing part here would be, um, most of the time, you're going to have three basic devices. You're going to have a smoke detector. You're going to have a heat detector. Or you're going to have a manual trigger, which usually would be those pull stations that you can see by the door that you can pull to, uh, to trigger the alarm. Okay. Uh, that's as far as the basic stuff. You also have things that are automatically triggered as far as kitchen fire suppression systems, which every kitchen, in the if you have a commercially run restaurant, you should have a kitchen fire suppression system. Otherwise, the authorities will not let you operate your restaurant. Okay, And those are automatic um, fire suppression systems usually installed where the heat happens above the stove or the oven or whatever it is where you know usually it's with gas uh, installations but uh, uh, but other ones as well whatever the heat is in the kitchen there should be a fire suppression uh, system and there you know 
there's a file code that specifies the details of that. If you're interested in fire alarm technician, it's just a little bit different than the electrical, but it ties with it. A little bit different than the data, but it ties with it. Everything's connected. But uh, fire technician or the fire um, um, specialist, uh, it requires some extra schooling because when you go and when you deal with fire alarm systems and the fire suppression systems, there's a lot to learn uh, about how the system should be installed, how the system should be inspected, uh, how the system should be troubleshooted, um, and all the laws that have to go have to do with it. So uh, our college does offer. Uh, uh, fire uh, fire program, so you might want to investigate if you're interested in that sort of thing. Also, in that uh, fire thing, also fire thing, the fire program also involves uh, as, as the future job. Uh, you would learn pretty much the fire code, just like you're learning the electrical code, um, and uh, the jobs would be most of this time would be uh, uh, inspecting the existing because. Uh, annually uh, or yearly, the system should be inspected for the, and they should be certified by a qualified personnel. Uh, the fire extinguishers should be put, um, um, placed in, uh, in specific locations. Uh, the pool station should be put in a specific location. So that's, that has to do with fire inspection or uh, recommending what should be there and you can give your signature as a qualified personnel. Yes, that's what I recommend it, uh, depending on what level of qualifications you have. Also, um, uh, some of the jobs involve uh, uh, sort of like um, post-fire inspections. So if there was a fire, you also might be sent as a, as a fire specialist, you might be sent to inspect the building and uh, I used to work for some time. Uh, where is it that I haven't worked <laughs> over the years? Uh, there was a brief time that I worked for a fire and safety company, and uh, I, I was able to. Um, I was hired as a as a communication specialist, uh, but also they wanted me to participate in the fire installations and the fire extinguisher inspections and service. And a uh, few times I had to go to do the inspection of uh, a building that was basically burned down. And uh, there will be different opinions that you would have to, uh, uh, different questions and different in inspection results you would have to provide for that. Talking like Yoda now, different results you will have to provide. You would have to. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> So that's the duties or, or more or less. And then it has to do also with fire sprinkler systems, which we're not going to uh, talk about here. But that's the, basically the, uh, the tasting platter of what's involved it, with fire, what's involved in security. Usually the companies who install fire systems, they also deal with the security alarms as well. Uh, all right, so, uh, so we have the sensing part. And as we said, it would be usually heat, smoke, or manual triggers. And the heat and smoke and the manual triggers or the automatic triggers as well, mechanical triggers, uh, they will have different uh, shapes and forms and purpose. Like for example, a heat detector for a bedroom, uh, you know what it looks like. It just looks like the uh, you know UFO saucer kind of stuck to the ceiling. Um, then, um, then that's what it looks like. Now, uh, there are some other smoke detectors that are placed in, uh, of, uh, in, in, in HVAC, in air ducts. So when there's a fire somewhere around the uh, boiler room or the, uh, the furnace room or somewhere there, uh, the smoke will also enter the HVAC system, which will be the air duct, the air supply system. There will be sensors in there as well. So obviously they will be looking a little bit different. And heat detectors as well, they, they have different shapes and forms and purpose. Uh, now the monitoring uh, or the communication lines, uh, right now they are sold in various different ways. Uh, they are usually, well, and some older days will be just a telephone line, automatic, uh, will be like a dial-up system. Now uh, you also have uh, internet-based communication systems and cellular, uh, uh, cellular um, based, so cell phone based communication systems as well. That goes also with the security alarms. Okay? 
So uh, you will have a modem or a PC or a phone line or internet connection, or um, uh, you would have cellular, or sometimes you have multiple uh, connections. If one fails, then the other one uh, takes over. All right, uh, and also you would have something that would be having this additional panels. Uh, so you would see sometimes there will be a main panel where all those wires are connected, and there will be a secondary annunciating panels. Uh, uh, and the annunciating panels would be a secondary panel just to display uh, what happened. And usually you would have different zones or written uh, things like uh, hallway B is. You know, something happened is happening there. Uh, it could be either fire, uh, fire condition or a trouble. Okay? And we'll talk about what the difference is between these two. So this will be just a display panels that are kind of working with uh, you know, with the main panel. Uh, and you would have control relay module and the remote uh, control module would be working with the sprinkler system. Uh, and security system or whatever other systems that you need. Sometimes when the fire happens, the conditions are that the windows are shut or something else is being triggered or the sprinkler gets triggered, whatever it is. And sometimes the sprinkler, um, uh, when the sprinkler gets triggered, it triggers the uh, uh, the alarm system or vice versa. So uh, so it's, it's the whole thing just works together. Okay? Um, so uh, as far that's as far as the kind of a main overview of the of the fire alarm system. Now uh, the zone. Let's just go back a little bit uh, to the alarm, the burglary alarm here. Okay, so that would be the security burglary alarm. Most of the time, you would have normal condition would be closed loop. Okay, when the switch opens, so the door contact or read switch r e e d it it's a switch that basically it's affected by a magnet so that's when you see the doors uh, or windows using those door contacts so called and they have different shapes different sizes and whatnot they are surface mount they are flash uh, round square rectangular whatnot um, i haven't seen triangular rare ones <laughs> um, so uh, for the most part, the, the, uh, the most popular connection is a closed loop. So the system has to be closed. And sometimes the panel is going to not let you arm the building. It's going to say, can't arm because the warehouse door is open. And you go, there, oh yeah, that's right. Somebody forgot to open, close the door, so let's close it. So that's it's just kind of self-monitoring system that way. So that's with the burglary alarm. Okay, when the loop opens, there is, you know, now, with some cases, you're going to have to, uh, you're going to want to have uh, a closed loop with the security alarm, or you're going to have sometimes end of line resistors, 470 kilo a resistor, end of line, depending on how the panel is configured, depending on how you want this thing to be configured. And mostly with the burglary zones, you are going to have to have a closed loop or end of line resistor, rarely you're going to have open loop. Okay? With an, well, end of line resistor would be yeah, uh, open loop as well. Uh, but that's for the most part for the security alarm, burglary alarm. Now let's take a look at the fire alarm, slightly, slightly different, okay? The devices, instead of normally closed as burglary alarm, the devices are normally open right? so you can have like a just a main bus wiring that goes for the uh, that services a zone and the system or the panel can have multiple zones you could have 12 zones 20 zones eight zones whatever this thing is done is whatever this is specified for uh, usually eight or 16 right and, and, and if you need more, then you get expansion boards. Uh, so zone one could be servicing a hallway. Zone two could be servicing another hallway. Zone three could be servicing smoke detectors um, uh, in the air ducts. 
uh, okay, um, the zone, the ladder zone could be servicing just one heat detector that is in the furnace room somewhere. So zones are configurable. So that's why I just call zones. And then you, you wire them up and you name them according to how you actually design the system. So the zone uh, in the fire loop is normally open devices. When they trigger, they close the switch. They short things out. What, does, what that gives us is, is the possibility, 47 kilo, not 470. Um, so 47 kilo is the end of line resistor, sorry. I said 470 uh, uh, about th three minutes ago. Uh, okay, so when you have an open loop like that, and it is terminated at the end of the loop with a 47 kilo ohm resistor, which is EOL resistor or end of line resistor. And usually it's like a, would be something like a faceplate. This is a different faceplate that I'm holding, but it would be just a blank faceplate with the resistor at the back here. And it's just put in the um, electrical box. And it's, uh, it actually shows end of line resistor. That's for the fire. Or sometimes it just has a little resistor symbol on it. Uh, and those should be put at the end of the line. That's why they're called end of line resistors. Right? Now, the question would be, what will happen if you put that end of line resistor right at the beginning of the zone? Would the system work? Yes, it would not give you... Um, a trouble condition, and if some of the resist, some of the uh, devices would trigger, it would probably trigger as well for the most part. But why do we put the end of line resistors at the end of the line? It is to make sure that there is nothing wrong with the cabling all the way through because the cable can go up the wall, through the ceiling, and to one device. And then it can go further in the ceiling, through the wall, and to another device, and so on. Okay? So sometimes what happens is there's a break in line. Something happens, maybe there's a construction, maybe some rodents, usually not, but sometimes uh, they do bite through the wires. Or for whatever reason, the line breaks. Okay? Then the system would see an open line, completely open line, you would not see the end of line resistor. And it would give you a very annoying buzz. It would not be something that you would have to cover your ears, but it would be just a buzz that would annoy the daylights out of you. So you call the service company to come and fix it because uh, it would show trouble condition. And on the main panel, it would actually show trouble. Right? And it would just keep buzzing periodically to drive the people nuts. Okay? So something is done about it. But it is not a alarm condition. So things would not be triggered. The monitoring station would not uh, dispatch the fire department and so on. But probably the, you would get a phone call if you're in the building that this thing is happening. You would get a phone call telling you that, uh, yeah, we are receiving trouble signal. Uh, do you have the buzz? That, yeah, it's buzzing all day since nine o'clock in the morning, da, da, da. Uh, so there would be a, whatever you have a contract with or the facility, you know, is, they would call the company that services that uh, alarm system. Okay. So by putting the resistor at the beginning of the line, this zone would sense that there's a 40, seven kilo ohm resistor here and it would trigger if some of the one of the sensors would close the loop but the functionality of the system would be compromised in a way that if there was a break here for example the system would still see the end of line resistor here and it would not notify you that there's a break and if that thing triggered, there will be break, the system would not receive the signal from this device. So that's why we have the end of line resistors. That's how the zone is solved with the fire alarms. So now you know. 
All right, fire alarm. Uh, okay, so it's okay. Well, we got one hour right now. Uh, let's take 10 minutes uh, to take a break. It is five after one, is it? It's six after one. It's just about to get six. So on your phones, when you have the universal clock here set up, 11 after uh, 11 after one, we're going to resume the uh, this this lesson here, okay? Just go to the bathroom, make yourself a fresh coffee, do what you have to do. 11 after one, we're going to resume the session. Okay.
Okay, we're back. Um, can we hear me? Sound check, this one too. Everybody awake? All right. Oh, we have 32 people now. That's great. Um, all right. So we're just going to continue with the uh, fire alarm uh, overview. And we are going to cover some of the security surveillance, which will be the security cameras idea. Okay. All right. So fire alarm sensors. We have basic sensors, heat, smoke, and manual pull stations. And I should include also mechanical automatic ones, something like uh, uh, kitchen suppression systems, but this is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's part of the fire alarm installations, but the kitchen suppression systems would be, um, would have sensors installed on top of the overhang that's there. And if there's, there's enough heat that goes in there, it basically breaks the line and it's a mechanical trigger and it causes all kinds of uh, things to happen. Uh, one of them is that it's going to suppress the fire. So you're going to have a uh, specifically designed foam that is going to deprive the fire of the oxygen. And after the foam stops, then the next thing that flows out uh, from those nozzles would be water, cold water, just to, uh, just to kind of uh, cool things down. Because even though when uh, you suppress the fire, things are still hot, the fire can either restart again or uh, somebody can get hurt. So the water follows through, but also it triggers fire alarm. And uh, uh, the, when the fire alarm is triggered, it uh, send, sends the signal to the monitoring station and uh, that triggers all kinds of events. Uh, you're going to have fire trucks uh, showing up your door. All right, uh, so that would be the mechanical sensors. Annunciators, bell, siren, usually it's called bell, uh, and then a strobe light. And that uh, is also interfaced with, could be uh, the, that the uh, the fire alarm can be also interfaced with um, uh, security alarm, monitoring, splink, splinkler, and sprinklers. It's it's very it could be interfaced with sprinkler systems, PA system, which is public address, kitchen fire suppression, and others. Okay, uh, control. Um, uh, the control uh, would be a fire alarm panel. You could uh, connect a laptop to program the uh, uh, the <clears throat> the panel. Uh, it also is being controlled through internet protocol to IP. Right? It would be remote, uh, or and also would be a remote access. And usually these two are tied together. Right? Now, when it comes to fire alarm or fire um, subject of the fire. Uh, there is electrical code in effect, okay? So things are, and there's a fire code in effect. So these two work together and there is some licensing involved. You can't just walk off the street and say, I wanna install fire alarm systems. You have to be licensed to do that. Yeah. All right, cabling that is being used for fire alarms. Um, these are just some examples of the, they have to be fire specified. Uh, which means they have to withstand certain conditions. You can just use any kind of wire because it has to withstand some heat or fire. So uh, it's not going to get damaged as easily as just a regular cable. All right, so um, uh, fire alarm will be unshielded and notice they are not twisted. Okay? Again, remember, uh, why is it that we are not twisting uh, security devices and security, I mean, also, I'm including the fire sensors. Um, <clears throat> it is because uh, from the last lecture, when we have a twist, that twist also has some inductive properties. And what do inductors do when they see change? They hate it, they try to oppose the change. So if something happens quickly, open and closes, that 
inductive property that those inductive properties that go around the line that is twisted might not acknowledge the signal on the other end because that sort of coil is going to oppose the change so that for this reason we are using straight line straight wires and twisted pairs okay? uh, so um, uh, then uh, we could have a shielded uh, foil shielded uh, we could have armored cable uh, unshielded and we could have armored cable foil shielded depending on what the specifications are usually the shielding comes with the noise but it also provides a little bit heat protection as well right so that's as far as cabling goes now we're going to move on to something it's called security surveillance what do we see on this picture and we're going to see the references to all the images that i'm using that uh, whatever i had to grab the images from the internet there are references here and they're going to be listed in the um uh, you can just grab those references and you can explore them further um, <clears throat> when you download the um, presentation here all right so what do we have so you know, this is a typical um, high-end um, monitoring system for the security surveillance which is the cameras and this would be a monitoring room if uh, somebody needs to watch them uh, watch the cameras all the time right quite often the security surveillance uh, consists of a lot of cameras being installed uh, around the facility and it would be connected to a display device which would be a big monitor sometimes and if there is a small business, somebody might sit, the owner or the manager could be sitting uh, in their office and they could be just watching those cameras. But also there are going to be this views from the cameras are uh, going to be recorded. And the purpose of in that case of the recording is that if something happens, you can go back and retrieve the uh, information and uh, put it on a jump drive give it to the police when it's requested or just have it for your own use. So that's the security surveillance. Uh, they are being interfaced with uh, now these days. Uh, OK, when the systems were first initiated, which would be years and years ago, probably before you were born, um, there would be VHS tape based or VCR tapes would be the magnetic tape. And uh, how it would work, it would be uh, something that's called a time lapse recorder, TLR, okay? Time lapse recorders. And what a time lapse recorder is, if you remember what a VCR is, video cassette recorder uh, for the consumer use. So instead of putting DVDs into the, uh, into the tray, you would put a cassette with a magnetic tape in it. So those would look sort of like VCR and they would use the same VHS tapes as the VCRs would use, except they would utilize those tapes a little bit different in a different way. There will be a time-lapse recording, so there will be time-sharing kind of multiplexing on the tape. So the, the tape would move along, it would record a snapshot of the camera one, they would move to camera two, move to camera three, so forth, and they were just looping around. Uh, so if you played that, uh, if you played that uh, uh, tape on a regular VCR, you would just see pretty much all the cameras at once switching around. Uh, but you would have to have the time lapse recorder, the the, the recorder that uh, that is designed for that in order to just lock onto only one camera and it will be time aligning the receiving of the signal from the tape if you want to see just one uh, one camera. Uh, and uh, that was sort of basically that's the way you know, the technology was at those times, we're talking 20 years ago or so. All right. uh, so <clears throat> uh, what was involved in there, there will be a designated person that would just have to go in the morning and change the tapes. Okay, so you would have the tapes change. Uh, it would just stop the stop the time lapse recorder or video tape recorder uh, VTR, and you would just put that on the shelf and you would mark this is Tuesday tape. 
put it on the shelf, get another tape, put it in, and that would just, uh, you could set it up so it's, uh, the tape would have to be changed every 12 hours or maybe 24 hours or something like that. So it would be just a regular thing. Now, um, uh, um, then uh, things moved to something that's called a DVR, uh, digital video recorders. So instead of having a bunch of tapes that had to be switched, there will be a hard drive uh, in there. Uh, so nothing will have to be changed. So the, the, the hard drive would keep recording the information. And depending on the size of the hard drive, uh, the information would be over, overrun because it would be a loop. Uh, you would have maybe, depending on how many cameras you have and how much information is on those cameras, you would get something, uh, you know, a week worth of a recording, sometimes two weeks of a recording, or sometimes a month worth of a recording that you can go back a month and check what happened a month ago, depending on how the system, obviously the more uh, uh, expensive systems, uh, they would use uh, some that would last at least a month, okay? But then some of the smaller ones, uh, depending on the size of the hard drive, you never know. Uh, it could be a system that uh, is recording a month, two months, uh, you can go back or sometimes it's a week or three days, depending on the quality of a recording um, and, the, um, and the size of the hard drive and the quality you can set up to, uh, you know, usually medium, uh, you know, low, medium or high quality of recording. Now, I'm going to, it's going to bring me to one point here. Whenever you're choosing um, a good um, security surveillance system, uh, you can see how the images are going to be displayed live on the monitor. So you would have a bigger monitor, right? And you would have different cameras kind of in the grid kind of a configuration. And you have different cameras on display. And you can push a, push a button on the, on the whatever the recording device or the control device is, where you can bring one of the cameras um, um, uh, to the front view. Okay, so on the big screen. So uh, what happens is that the images, usually when you see them live, uh, somebody say, look how clear things are. This is great. So you can see the cars moving. You can see people walking and da, 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 da. What makes, what separates a mediocre type of a system from a good one, <laughs> I love those. Is the quality of a recorded image. Okay. That's because, you know, if somebody's trying to sell you a system, uh, don't pay attention. Well, pay attention to the quality of the image or, or, or of a life, um, uh, of a life view, and it's going to be great. The thing is, show me the recorded image because that's where it matters, okay? And sometimes there are really big differences in the quality of the image of the motion picture, if you will, uh, when it comes to the, watching the recorded image. So that's where you wanna pay attention to. The other thing is how quickly can you zero in on the motion or, the, or something that happened? If, let's say that could be uh, something could have happened in around the hallway here or hallway there or beside that door or somewhere, wherever it is. And then you're going to try to find that point in time that something happened. So what are you going to do? You're going to sit and watch this thing for the 12 hours, one to one, until something happens. It gets boring after very, very short time, trust me. So you want to see the features on how quickly you can find that there will be a motion sensing features that after the image is being recorded, you can actually zero in on a specific element of the picture. And it says, take me to the point that you can see somebody grabbing that doorknob, okay? Uh, and everything else that's happening in the motion, there could be people walking by. We don't care about that. We just want to find out if somebody actually touches that spot or finds themselves in that spot. So that also separates a good system from a so-so system. And everything works, you know, as I keep saying, nothing happens until something happens. And then uh, when you really have to use it, then you're going to have to pay attention to the quality of the recorded image and how quickly you can 
uh, pinpoint uh, some sort of an event that would uh, that would happen. Okay, so um, so that's as far as the security surveillance. Thank you. We got the lever here. <laughs> um, so um, so as far as that. Okay, now typical uh, security camera. Well, I'm going to tell you, you can see here, uh, well, the cameras could be a, a bullet shaped or dome shape. Uh, um, the thing is on how they work. They would, uh, like 20 years ago, for example, there would be analog type of a camera. And the analog camera would involve a signal wire and a power wire so you would have two cables going into one each camera and uh, quite often what happens is that they would uh, the industry would put, come up with wires that are called siamese cables just like siamese twins um, so uh, the, in one jacket thing you would have a signal cable and you would have the power cable and the signal cable usually would be a coaxial type and it usually would be the cable of a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms, okay, usually, all right, for the security cameras. And then there would be um, 18 gauge two conductor uh, power supply, and you would, uh, and sometimes the camera would request uh, 12 or 24 volts DC, and sometimes you would call, you would request maybe 18 volts or 24 volts AC signal, depending on the manufacturer, depending on the camera that was made. And the signal that would travel through that uh, cable, the camera would be connected to the whatever the recording device or the control device, it would be connected in an analog way. So the, the coaxial cable would carry the video signal part and the power, it will be con uh, conveying the power into the camera. And they the uh, cameras sometimes would be powered locally from wherever the camera is, there would be an outlet somewhere close by or power supplies or possibility, they will be plugged in there. Or sometimes they will be plugging the, the, this, this um, power cable uh, would run all along and it will be just getting its power from some sort of a powering device or power supply device right at the central location. There will be pros and cons to both. Uh, uh, you know the advantage of um, locally powered. You would lose. Uh, you would have to use less cable, uh, but then you would have to make sure that there's a power beside every camera, and sometimes it will be difficult. Uh, the disadvantage uh, of the running, you know, uh, every cable to the central location. You would use more cable. However, you would have more control because you would have one, one central location. You would have the power cables and you would know what's powering what. So if there's a trouble, you know where to look for things. Except, you know, otherwise you would have to look in the city. The other problem is uh, that um, in the analog, the old analog systems, and you would still see some of those. Some of those are being sold as the new systems. Uh, that's the one that you would see a one B and C connector uh, onto the uh, camera. And then you would see a uh, just like a power jack that uh, they would just you know, uh, plug in the power. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, those cables usually are supplied in the box. You would get maybe 100 or 150 cable, or 100 or 150 foot cables with that. These would be the K, uh, systems that were in the box. It cost maybe three, $400, would be at Costco. Used to be at the Future Shop, now Best Buy. Um, maybe they still sell it. You can buy a whole bunch of stuff online. These are the old analog systems, okay? Uh, and they come with uh, four cameras. So usually the systems would come in four, uh, four, eight, 16, or 32 configurations of cameras, okay? Now, the, some of the Costco I've seen, uh, one of my friends have bought one of those, and uh, it was a six camera system, okay? Uh, so, <clears throat> so that would be the older uh, analog way of, uh, of uh, installing cameras. Now, uh, with the old analog system, you would have to home run all the cables to the central location. Okay? Also, the problem with powering locally 
the camera. So you would have a camera somewhere down the hallway and you would power it locally out of the some outlet that is beside the whatever the camera is. Um, they would have different ground references or different neutral references. The grounding would be at different levels. Yes, ground should be at, you know, but ideally the ground should be ground. However, if you have different parts of the buildings, the grounding is becomes funny, becomes funny. So uh, you would have the ground level sitting at different potentials. That's how you get something that's called ground loops. Because in the ground wire, you would have electricity flowing in the ground wire because one ground reference is at some point, the other ground reference is some other point. So of course you're gonna have a current flow through it. And when that happens, you get uh, unwanted effects such as uh, um, stripes running through the um, through the screen, through the, the noise. So we usually be the stripes running uh, on the screen. So that was the you know the biggest problem with that. So usually people would prefer to power things off from the same central location. So everything has the same ground reference. Okay. Now. Uh, this camera that you see here, and this, most of the time you're going to see that, is the IP camera, which is the internet protocol camera. Okay? Um, so the camera <clears throat> would act as a um, regular sort of smart device. And it would have IP address, internet protocol address. Uh, and it would be controlled, you'd be able to control things. So it basically looks like just a, a smart device that uses Ethernet. And what do you plug into it? You plug in the RJ45 uh, plug. So that's when I showed you during the labs how to terminate the RJ45 jack or plug onto the end of the cable. That's where you will be terminating those because you'll be pulling minimum cat 5 e to each camera. And then at the end of the cable, you can terminate this thing into a box, a surface mount box that could be stuck on the wall somewhere. And you would use a patch cable to connect that into the camera, or you could just put the, uh, or you could just terminate the cable with the RG45 plug and plug it straight into this oh, here. Look at my mouse here, <laughs> okay, right here. Yeah. Now those uh, those plugs would be uh, would have additional sealing or sealants or uh, protection against the environment, uh, so so the moisture doesn't get in and so on. Because usually those things are in the soffits, in the ceilings, and things like that. Or some of them are outside, so you don't want the moisture to get in there. Now, over here you could see additional type of an input jack. So that's where you can plug in a power. Okay. And here you can plug in the power uh, from the local, locally. Um, and there's a less of a chance for the ground loops to happen, although they still can, but a little bit less of a chance when you have a digital transmission uh, link required. So the CAT 5E runs on a lot of things. So uh, again, here's a camera. Now, you do not have to use that if you have something that's called PoE, power over ethernet, remember? And some, uh, usually it's 48 volts DC, but some of the uh, systems, PoEs have different uh, voltages, like 24 volts or something like that. Usually it's 48 volts, but there would be some deviations from that, depending on the equipment and depending on the situation. But most of the time, you're going to see um, 48 volts uh, DC. So in that case, if you have PoE port on the recording device or the control device, you will not need to use the separate power. You can just tape it off, seal it, and tuck it in the box. Okay? Uh, and then they would just plug in. So that's uh, that's the advantage of that. And most of the time, you're going to see those. Now, what can you do with those? Um, did I? All right. Here's a typical um, something that's called. You see, I put NVR slash DVR because after the videotape recorders or VTRs or time lapse recorders. 
which utilized the VHS. And I can see Jacob said, I watched a VHS movie yesterday. All right. <laughs> that would bring some sentiments. Um, yeah, still a lot of good people, good, good movies that people have in the collections, they, uh, they would still have in some of the VHS tapes. That would bring some sentiments back to me uh, when I watch one of those. Anyways, so then uh, you would have later on, I told you that people started using, well, people, the industry started using um, the DVRs, which would be digital video recorder. Mm -hmm. So that would be in the device that records things onto a hard drive. And then uh, sometimes they are called NVRs, which is called network video recorder. So network, so it's networkable, which would be Ethernet type of thing. Uh, usually one means the other, okay? Uh, because even those earlier DVRs, we were able to put them on network already, okay? The networks uh, were developed enough uh, by then. So NVR, DVR, depending who produces that, uh, they would be calling that, but usually they're the same thing. Okay, both of them use the hard drive to record the information and they are networkable devices, which is right here. You can see at the back of that, you can, you can see the ethernet port. And over here, this is a simple one. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cameras, uh, uh, NVR or DVR. And you can see ethernet ports right onto them. So you connect wire or cable which is cat 5 e minimum. And you plug it into the port here on the recording device on NVR. And the other end goes and plugs in right into the camera. That's it, done. All you have to do is aim it and point it. Uh, you don't even have to focus that anymore because those cameras uh, have automatic focus and uh, they have gone a long way because before you used to have, you had to focus them. Actually, you know what? You still have some of them depending on who makes them and how, uh, how they are arranged, okay? So, uh, but you can also control them. Now, in this case, if you have direct wiring here, it, there's not much that you have to configure aside from the time and the date and maybe the quality that you want this thing to record. You know, the quality usually you get six settings low, medium, or high, low, <coughs> excuse me, with a low quality of recording, you get a longer time before the whole system loops and starts re-recording the old information, but you have the less of the quality of the image, all right? Now, when you go to medium or high, you have a higher quality image, but of course it uses more space on the hard drive, uh, and then uh, instead of having something that's like two weeks that is recorded information, you can go two weeks back, maybe you're going to have five days of going back and retrieving the information. So it's a give and take um, when it comes to that kind of stuff, right? So you can connect those straight in. There will be home runs. Also, what you can do is you can connect this ethernet port into a switch, right? And the switch can be connected to cameras. So that's how things are done right now. Instead of running all the cameras into one spot, because this is just a simple eight camera device but sometimes you have 32 cameras. Sometimes you get 64 cameras around the building. Depends you know, how big of a system it is. And some of the more serious ones, they have a lot of cameras. So it is strategically better sometimes to, instead of everything doing a home run, and sometimes some of the bigger ones, they're even incapable of having those ports so you could wire them directly or plug them in directly. You would have um, remote um, devices. Like for example, from the ethernet port of one of the, of the network of the main control panel or the control device, you would run one, let's say CAT6A link 
here, or cut six, that would go into a switch. And from the switch, you would connect the cameras. These are the IP cameras. The, in, the ethernet signal goes through it. It's a digital device. Yeah? And then you would run another cable somewhere else, somewhere completely different way, far, far, but the other way in the building. And you would connect a switch or a hub, but switch is better. Remember what the difference between switch and a hub is? Switch remembers the MAC addresses of the devices and whatever the information goes is addressed to certain type of a device, it goes straight to it. Whereas a hub, it basically, uh, it's less smart. It doesn't remember. It doesn't, it just knows that things are connected to it. And when there's information uh, or data addressed to one of them, it just shouts to all of them. And whoever is the information to, it's going to respond. The device is going to, so, uh, uh, switch is a little bit better because it just saves the amount of traffic that is needed um, because things are being communicated directly with as, uh, as opposed to broadcasting and whoever answers. So then every, so there's more traffic going on. So things are slower a little bit. So this could be a, the hub was going to work as well. Uh, so uh, you could just connect a switch to that and this could be in another part of the building. And this could be, a, you know, so you get the idea here, what's, uh, you know, how, uh, how you can distribute the, the, the wiring here and the cable. So you don't have to run. So you only have to, look how much wire do you save here? You just have to have one link here going to the switch. And this could be, uh, you know, about 250 feet. And there will be a three or four cameras here. And then only you need the cable from here to where the to the location. So you just save a lot of cabling here because they will be home running to the secondary location or the intermediate location. Okay? Uh, so that's the advantage of using the uh, IP cameras, the Ethernet or Internet protocol cameras. They also have the IP addresses. So it takes a little bit, the process is a little bit more complicated because once you connect the direct, once you connect everything directly to the inputs, the system doesn't have to figure out which camera is which. It just senses on all the individual. But in the small systems, you are able to do that. In the big systems, you would have to have, a, the thing, this thing would have to look huge just to accommodate the ports. Yeah? Um, now, uh, when it comes to doing it this way, uh, you would have to get the IP addresses of every camera and you would have to configure that and you have to uh, enter the IP addresses into the system, make sure that the system recognizes that. And then based on that, <coughs> you can name them or you can um, make them behave a certain way. So the, system, this, the setup is a little bit more complicated and it goes a little bit different with every type of a system that you get. Different brands have this interface solved in a different way. And uh, if you are interested in any of the stuff that I'm talking about, either the fire alarms or security alarms um, or the surveillance cameras, PA systems, whatever not, maybe there's something that you're installing at your home. Talk to me during the lab or send me an email. I'll, you know, I'll try to help you as much as I can. Or if you, um, if, if you land yourself a job somewhere and you're stuck with some problem, I've done this thing for 30 years plus. So uh, usually the problems that you're going to encounter, probably I have dealt with them at some point in the past. Or uh, later on, if you want to start your own business doing this kind of stuff, I can also help you with uh, which direction you might want to take or which steps you might want to take because I've done all of that over the last 30 years, okay? Uh, now, security surveillance, so there'll be, this will be the topology that will be in a tree configuration. See, it just reminds a little bit of a tree, so it branches out. Okay? So the security surveillance topology tree, okay? Now versus the star, this would be the smaller, usually the smaller systems, typical surveillance systems with a digital video recorder, DVR, and a remote off-site viewing. I got this thing from this reference right here, and you can just go and explore that uh, website that I got it from. Uh, 
this would be the smaller systems and they will be home run. So this is what I showed you about, uh, we just talked about the first part of this topology here. So it'll be a star topology. There is less configuration happening, but you're limited physically because if you have a 32 or 64, this equipment is just gonna have to be so much bigger, okay? And they're using a lot more wire. But how there's uh, being uh, set up, uh, usually it will have a local monitor here so you can visit, uh, visit, you can view things, or this thing can be connected to the cloud, to the internet, through a modem or through a router, through a switch. You can have your business somewhere, you can view the cameras from your home, and you can also configure things. They're very this it's so much easier to configure things like in the older days uh older days uh, you know, 10 years ago even 10 years ago uh things would be a little bit more difficult to configure you would have to usually would call the support tech support uh, from over the company they would walk you through it and then after you've done a few of those you'll be able to set this thing up by yourself uh, but now more, more and more things are you know, kind of a plug and play. Still, there is some security involved because it's a security system. So it's not just uh, you know anybody can view whatever you want to view, but, uh, but it's much easier as far as plugging things in and configuring things. Yeah. Uh, security surveillance cabling, CAT 5E minimum. So remember, we used to with the with the when we're talking about the security burglar systems, burglary systems, burglar systems, Hamburger burglar. Um, we were talking about the Z cable. Who is Z? Never mind. Uh, Z four, Z eight, but usually Z four. So Z is the type of a cable which is straight. It uses red green black and yellow, right? and the four would be how many conductors are inside. So Z4 will have four conductors, and they are straight. Next time you're in the lab, ask me to show you that cable. Um, and they're untwisted. We don't want to have a twist in the cable that runs security devices or the security sensors. When it comes to fire alarms, we also use straight untwisted cable, but it has to be fire rated. It has to be made for, it has to be made for fire system installations. But it also would be four conductors, usually sometimes two conductors, depending on what you conduct, what you are connecting. Right? Uh, sometimes six or eight conductors. It just gives you the more possibility of connecting more devices on different zones, and some of them have to be powered, whatever. Right? And when it comes to surveillance systems, sometimes you are going to use those Siamese cables, which would be one coaxial cable or concentric cable with the B and C connector on it that goes to the video, and you would have one power jack, and they will be all incorporated into one jacket thing. So it looks like one cable, but it's actually two in one, right? two different cables. Uh, those things, to my surprise, they're still being sold. Um, you can still buy them online, but those are the analog systems. Most of the time right now, you wanna go with the digital system, which is the IP cameras, which is, that's the way to go. Uh, this uh, images are clearer, the resolution are clearer. Um, now, Um, people are going to say, what's the resolution, this and that, and the other thing. Yeah, okay, the resolution or the 4K is the way to go, but here's the, what I want you to understand. You can have a 4K capability camera, but if you have a receiver or the control box that is kind of low quality, who cares if the camera is able to give you 4K into that thing when this thing, when this device, the recording device, makes a mess out of the signal and whatever the recorded image is, is going to be messy, blurry, and just uh, just bad, okay? So the thing that, uh, you know, that you want to pay attention to if somebody is trying to show you something that you can buy or recommend to your clients, uh, look at the recorded image. 
okay? Because that there's a huge difference from a good system to a bad system. You're going to see things that to the point that you won't be able to recognize people's faces to actually recognizing people's faces. That could be, that's that's as far as the, that's the difference that uh, things can make. And the other thing to look for it is how quickly you can find the recorded image. Because if you have to watch 16 cameras, uh would in the in from eight o'clock p.m to 1 a.m that's so many hours you know you don't want to sit you would just want to be able to punch things in control things and zero in on the action that happens in that specific location okay so uh again if you are uh, if you're interested in that a little bit more talk to me if you want or send me an email later on okay and that is it for today's lesson. Uh, we have, uh, okay, now, uh, we're going to have a test. Let me see here. Um, I'm just going to look at this. Um, I'm going to queue it up a little bit. I'm just going to take a look at the schedule, what's going on. Because we're going to have a test coming up soon, another test. Here. Here. And let me just queue up the uh, our class portal. Make myself look like a student. Can I go in here? Profile. I can't even do that now with this one here. All right, here, here's our class. And let's see the content here. Is our course outline? That's the one you want to look at. Here's the course plan. Um, or do I have it somewhere here? Course plan. Lecture 13, there's a course plan. When it loads, all right, there it goes. So what do we have here? This is week, uh, we are week uh, nine right now, March 15, March 19. No, we are week 10, sorry, we're week 10. Um, yeah, because it's 20, 26th. So today is 26th, March 26th. So next week, after next week, I still have to do one more lesson. So we're going to do the same thing. Uh, oh, wait a second. It's a good Friday. You know what? I'm going to have to think about what to do with this okay because it's a good friday so i'm we're going to deploy a test next week after uh you know um, but i still have to do one more lesson so maybe we're going to have a slip of one week uh when it comes so you know what i'm going to figure it out and i'm going to uh, put this thing in the announcements okay because there's just one more lesson and there's a test will be test three and then there's going to be another test so um uh but uh next week is good friday yeah, so there's not going to be no class. Okay, so that's it for today. And uh, see you in class, see you in lab. And of course, if you have any questions or clarifications, send me an email or talk to me during the lab. Have a good one, guys. Thank you.